All right, good evening. Well, I heard there was ice cream, so I had 22 pages. I cut it down to 10 to be out of here really quick. I'm just kidding. Um, so thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Pastor Jimenez for allowing me and giving me the honor to preach before you. Um, got to meet quite a few of you this morning. Um, thank you to the Pazarnsky family, uh, Miss Heidi, uh, uh, giving us a, a great lunch this afternoon, and the family uh, uh, being generous to us. I see Brother Jared got my envelope because he gave me a nice welcome, so thank you, sir. I'm just kidding. No, there is no envelope, brother. Don't ask me for it later, please. Um, so just thank you for the opportunity. And most of you came back, so that's a good thing. So maybe it's the ice cream. Thanks, Brother Frank. That's a good idea. <laughs> um, so tonight we're in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look down at, uh, in your Bibles at verse number 16. The Bible reads in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on this verse tonight um, just to kind of encourage us, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a newer church and, and I myself am newer to uh, uh, the new IFB, if you will, um, in being Baptist and, and, and taking this journey with the Lord. But I want to kind of focus on that verse and just help us understand how we can use the Word of God for everything, all Scripture, for, uh, to, te to teach us, to, uh, that's for the doctrine, to know what's right, for reproof, to know what's wrong, and then for correction on how to make that right. So it's important that we understand that and just, you know, this second letter to Timothy, Paul is writing, you know, Paul is, is writing to a, a, a young uh, pastor, if you will, you know, teaching him how to set up a church, how to, st uh, how to start a church, how to uh, teach people in a church. And this uh, second, second book that he's writing to him is basically encouraging him not to be ashamed, not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Amen. not to be ashamed of the gospel of Paul himself who's writing to him. You know, it's, uh, it's important for us to understand that we, we should not be ashamed. Um, you say, Dave, why go through this? Well, isn't it true that we hear many false statements for those of us that go to a church like this, a Bible-believing church, um, that want a desire to follow Jesus Christ, I mean, they ridicule us for, our, for women uh, dressing as women. You know, they look down upon us for, you know, believing what the commandments say and trying to follow that. Oh, you need to keep up with the world. You need to keep up with the times. Um, I mean, just things like that that we're told. So tonight what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to just remind us through all scriptures that we can answer those false statements. You know, the Bible reads, um, you don't have to turn there, but 1 Timothy 3.15 says this, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. And we talked about that this morning. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we also can use the Bible, all scripture, to answer those that come up with these false statements. So I'd encourage you to take notes in the back of your bullets, and there's a spot for you to take notes if you don't have a baby on you, um, if you like. But um, there are many false statements. Obviously, we don't have the time to go through all of them, but I narrowed it down to just three of probably the most uh, often said, uh, whether we're knocking on doors or whether we you know, are, are in the streets and just the way we live our lives. And the first one is this. We do not have the preserved Word of God. I mean, how many times have you heard that one? We do not have the preserved Word of God. And what I mean by that is we don't have God's actual Word today in 2019 as, as they had it way back when. But that's a, raw, that's a false statement. How can we make that right? Well, look at verse 14 there in uh, 2 Timothy. Verse number 14. Paul says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child that has known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So right off the bat, you have Paul the Apostle telling Timothy that he's already got the word of God. He's already learned things from the scriptures that he has had back then. But we have that same scripture now today. We have that same letter that uh, Timothy was reading that Paul wrote to him. We have that today. So, um, do we have the same word now? There's a question, right? 
If you don't have the preserved word of God, Dave, you, you have basically what was given by man and man messed it up. Well, let's see if that's true. I want you to hold your place there in 2 Timothy 3 and go with me to the book of Psalms. If you open your Bible right in the middle, you'll more than likely fall in the book of Psalms and go to Psalm number, uh, chapter number 12. Psalm chapter 12. And because we gotta, it, it's, it's important for us to, to always be ready to answer those questions, right? I mean, we also have young people here that are looking at us to answer those questions. So Psalm chapter 12 and verse 6, the Bible reads this, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Who? God shall keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation, how long? Forever. Amen. So the Bible is teaching us right here that it's God's job to do that. By the way, in your message, the ESV, the NIV, doesn't say that he will keep, he will preserve his word. Do you know that? So that's interesting to know. That's why we are King James only Amen. in this church. Right. So whose job is it right off the bat to preserve God's word? It's his. Can he not keep that promise? Turn to Psalm 100 in the book of Psalms. A few Psalms down. Psalm 100. Let's look at more precepts or statues that we can look at about what God feels about his word. Psalm 100. Look down at verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. So that's when we're long gone, His truth is still going to be here. Go to Psalms 119, longest chapter in the Bible. I'd like to highlight a few verses in Psalm 119. You cannot read Psalm 119 in the King James Bible and walk away not knowing that God is serious about His Word. Amen. I don't have it in my notes here, but there's 176 verses. I think there's four of them that don't have the word judgment or word or statues or precept. There's 174, uh, 72 verses that actually speak about that. I think he's pretty serious about that. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I do want to highlight some. Look at verse 89. Psalm 119 and verse 89. Forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled, settled in heaven. So it's already forever. Amen. Verse 90. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. I guess this generation's out of luck. Verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Perhaps everlasting doesn't mean everlasting, right? Verse 144, the righteousness of thy testimony is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. There's that everlasting. That's not really everlasting, huh? How about verse 152? Verse 152, concerning thy testimonies, I have known of all that thou hast founded them forever. There might be a theme here for everlasting, huh? Verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. So we see right off the bat in this psalm is, and I just briefly scaved through a few of these, but his word is forever to all generations. Go with me to Isaiah. You're in Psalms, so if you go after Psalms, you got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Songs of Solomon, Isaiah, Isaiah 51. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51, look at uh, verse number 6. The Bible reads, Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. Verse 7, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revelings. Don't be afraid when somebody tells you you don't have the preserved word of God, because we do. Amen. We do. Right. Verse 8, For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be for how long? Forever. Amen. Forever. And my salvation from where? From generation to generation. You say, okay, Dave, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you got that. But you know what? Did you know that we are in the New Testament? All right, well, let's, let's see that. Let's, let's see it in the New Testament. 
Keep your place in Isaiah. So if you keep your place in 2 Timothy 3, also keep your, your place in Isaiah. I'll try to have you not keep too many places where you run out of fingers, but just so you can get back to it quickly. But go to, with me in the New Testament, New Testament to uh, the book of John, John ch chapter 17. The book of John, chapter 17. I'll read from you uh, Proverbs 30 and verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. How can we put our trust in him if we don't have the preserved word of God? Right? John, chapter 17. Look at verse 17. John, uh, John 17, 17. This is Jesus speaking. His prayer to his disciples. He's praying also for us that would come after him. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. His word is truth. Go back to chapter 6 in John. Well, how do we know that his, his word is truth if we don't have it, right? John chapter 6, look all the way at the end of the chapter there, down at verse 63. This is also Jesus speaking. John chapter 6 and verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What words? The same word that God has preserved from generation to generation to generation. Amen. Otherwise, that would make no sense. Otherwise, that would uh, be a foolish statement. Do we tell our children to obey the, the things that we say for them to do and not do, but yet we don't tell them what that is? No, that would be foolish. So the same way with God. Drop down to verse uh, 66 there in chapter 6. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye go? Will ye also go away? I love the response of Peter. I love it. Then said Peter in verse 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. How do we get eternal life? Through the Word of God. Amen. If we don't have it, we don't have eternal life. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Go to Luke uh, chapter 22. If you go backwards from John, it's just the next book backwards. Luke chapter 22. How can it be that God preserved not His Word when Jesus in the flesh says this? Luke chapter 22, drop down to verse 33. Jesus speaking here. Verse 33, Luke 22, verse 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Shall not pass away. I could be wrong, but I think that God does not need any help to preserve his word. He doesn't need man to say, hey, I need to do this for the Lord. No, he preserved it. He promised it. So we have the preserved word of God. It's called the King James Bible in the English language. Amen. So we indeed have the preserved word of God. Numbers, otherwise, God lied to us. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Hath he not said that he would preserve his word? Can he not fulfill that promise? No, that would be silly. So you say that, to say that we, have, we don't have the preserved word of God is a false statement. Well, how do we make that right? We believe what the God says, what God says. We believe the promise that he has, that he would preserve it. Another false, so the first false statement we see is this. We do not have the preserved word of God. Another one that we hear a lot is, we're done with the Old Testament, with all of the Old Testament, right? We're done with the Old Testament law. I'm so done with hearing that statement. Amen. What's wrong with this statement? How do we make it right? Well, go back to our verse for tonight, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 10 says, But thou hast known, has fully known my doctrine. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, peace. I want you to think about that, my doctrine. Let's see if Paul's doctrine teaches that we're done with all of the Old Testament law. Keep your place there in 2 Timothy. Go with me to Deuteronomy. In the beginning of the Bible, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 4. You notice in our church we use a lot of not only New Testament scriptures, but Old Testament scriptures 
I'll share this quick story. I had some bozo tell me, Dave, Jesus is in the New Testament. Well, first of all, if I wanted to say that Jesus is only in the New Testament, tells me, number one, you have not read your Bible. Because Jesus is just as much in the Old Testament as the first four words of the Bible as he is in the last in the New Testament as the last word in the Bible, which has four letters. In the beginning, God, because he is God, and the Amen, because he is the Amen. amen. So that just tells me you haven't read your Bible. Deuteron where, where are you at? Deuteronomy chapter 4, look at verse number 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live. Interesting. And go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command. Skip down to verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whether you go to possess it. Keep what? Verse 6. Keep what? Keep therefore and do them. Keep the commandments that are found in his word. Keep the judgments that are found in his word. Keep, therefore, and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this is a great nation and is wise and an understanding people. So God gives wisdom and understanding in following in his words. Proverbs 2.6 says this, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. How do we have that if... We don't have the Word of God. Drop down to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Talking about following God's commandments. Did he get rid of the Old Testament commandments? Did he get rid of everything in the Old Testament? Deuteronomy chapter 5. Riddle me this, Batman. This is the bozo I'm talking about that told me that Jesus is only in the New Testament. Riddle me this, Batman. How do we uh, attain wisdom and knowledge? Isn't it by following his commandments? Isn't it by reading his Word? Deuteronomy chapter 5. Verse 29, Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep just the New Testament scriptures? Just some of the commandments. Is that what it says? No, it says all commandments. How often? Always. Always. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. So we see the promise, because it's, it's funny that he has a blessing when we keep his commandments. Not just temporary, but forever. Not just for us, but for our generation to come after us. So how are we supposed to teach our children His commandments if they're done away with? Turn to Matthew, because you might say, well, you're still stuck in the Old Testament, Dave. But go to Matthew, first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5. Let's see what Jesus says about the law. Matthew chapter 5, and verse, we'll look at verse 17. Jesus says this, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Hmm, interesting. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Amen. You say, oh yeah, Dave, but you know what Romans 10, 4 says? For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Well, what law is that? What law? Go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. If you start from the back of your Bible, you have Revelation, Jude, 3rd, 2nd, 1st John. 2nd and 1st Peter, James, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. What's ended? What's, what's, uh, what has he had done away with? Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse number 1. And then verily the first commandment had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Paul is talking about the, uh, describing the purpose of the tabernacle built. With hands, he's talking about the, the table, the showbread, the golden center, the cherubims that are supposed to be in there. For the sake of time, we'll drop to verse 7. Verse 7 in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. But into the second went the high priest only once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. So the way into the holiest of all wasn't made known yet while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, because this was a picture of what was to come. Verse 9, which is a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts, sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as, per as pertaining to the conscience. So they offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make one 
sinless. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinals, cardinal ordinances. That's important. Remember that. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. Ordinances, these are ordinances that were imposed on them until the coming of Christ. Verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in, in, in once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. So Christ was the end of what? Of the ordinances. Because we still uh, uh, would be sacrificing today if it wasn't for Christ. He was the perfect Lamb of God to take away the sins. Let's go, found in what? So we find, found in what? Not in all the law. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. If you go backwards from Hebrews, you've got Philemon, Titus, 2nd and 1st Timothy, 2nd and 1st Thessalonians, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. So Paul is very clear in what was abolished in the law. Ephesians chapter 2, look down at verse 13. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who, were so, who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the entire... No, it says enmity. I thought it said entire. Entire law? No. But he abolished in his flesh the enmity, even all the law? No. Even the, com even the law of commandments, please don't miss it, contained in the ordinances. He didn't get rid of all the Old Testament law. He fulfilled the ordinances of the Old Testament law. What ordinances? Well, the ordinances that we read in Hebrews, the ordinance of the animal sacrifices, that could never take away sin. Amen. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so make him peace, verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enemy thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off unto them that were made high. So why did he abolish those laws, those sacrifices? In verse 18, for through him we, ha we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. He is the flesh, the perfect sacrifice for us. That's what he got rid of. That's what's fulfilled. Isaiah 53, 12 says this, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, speaking of Jesus, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and bare the sin of many, and made intercession for our transgressions. He, he did that for us. That's what's abolished. We didn't look at it, but Hebrews 10, 4 says this, For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It was only through the blood of Christ that would be able to do that. Amen. That's what's abolished. Yep. Seems like Paul's doctrine doesn't say anything about getting rid of all the Old Testament law. How do we make this statement right? Well, we make it right by believing what the Bible says. Just read it. So God has indeed preserved His Word. God has not destroyed all the Old Testament law. Let's talk about what is required for salvation, because I know we hear this one a lot. You've got to work to be saved. Right? We have to do work for us to be saved, number three. We have to do work. What's wrong with this statement? How do we make it right? Let's go back to our 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's look, uh, look right there, verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of them own selves, covetous, boasters, proud. Isn't those people proud when you knock on somebody's door? Yeah, I live a good life. I had a pastor tell me, he gave me his whole resume about when he was in elementary school. What, every school that he's graduated from. I was like, okay, so are you trusting in that? No, I just needed to let you know that. Okay. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth makers, false act accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, haiti, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. People looking at their own works rather than that which was done on them on the cross. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Keep that in mind, that turn away part. Let's look at what Scripture says about believing in salvation. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 14. Genesis, Exodus, Exodus 14. 
This is, this is uh, the Lord just delivering the nation of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. Exodus uh, 14 and verse, we'll skip down to verse 30 here. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Notice chapter 15. Notice how Moses ties in salvation. Verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He is become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Who saved them? God did. Go back with me to Isaiah. I don't know if I told, did I tell you to keep your finger in Isaiah? Go to Isaiah 43. After uh, Psalms, you have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Isaiah 43. Who saves us? Who does the work for us? Isaiah 43 and verse 8. The Bible reads, And bring forth the blind people that have eyes, the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered together. Let the people be assembled who among them can, de can declare this and show us former things. Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe. Who do we know and believe? And understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Amen. No one can save us except the Lord. Amen. Verse 12, I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was I am He, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work. Wait. Who works? He will work. And who shall let it? God works. He worked for us by sending His Son on the cross for us. Amen. Look at uh, Isaiah 44. It's a few pages over. Verse 21, Isaiah 44 and verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob, in Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Wait. I thought I had to work to be forgiven. No. He says he did that as a cloud. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. God saves us. God does the work. Look at 45, Isaiah 45, verse 20. Isaiah 45. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge and set up, and set up the wood of their graven image, image and pray unto a God that cannot save. By the way, if you're working for your salvation, you're praying to a God that will and cannot save you, period. Verse 21, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel all together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just and a Savior. There is no God bef beside me. Look unto me and be what? Saved. Wait. Look unto my works? No. God says look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Let's go to, uh, back to Psalms. I'm not sure if I asked you to keep your place there, but Psalm chapter 143. Can we justify ourselves? Can we be justified? We're just looking at nothing but Scripture, right? All Scripture. Profitable for doctrine? Psalm 143, verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness, and enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight...
shall no man, shall no man living be justified. You can't be justified without God. You can't be justified without the blood of Jesus Christ. It can't happen. We can't, we can't happen. You say, Dave, okay, there you go again. You are in the Old Testament. Okay, go to Matthew, first book in the Bible, Matthew. I think that's where the Bible says New Testament, Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Look at John chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Tons of scriptures we can look at. Tons of them. I'm going to highlight a few. John chapter 4. We got to work to be saved? I don't know about that. John chapter 4, verse 42. John chapter 4, verse 42, they believe in the woman now. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Go to Acts chapter 4, next book over, Acts chapter 4. Who saves? Well, we saw that the Lord only saves. He does the work. Jesus was brought forth to save. Acts chapter 4. Peter talking here to the, to the priests, the Sadducees, about Jesus after the healing of the lame man that was uh, at the gate of the temple. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen. Sounds like the same God. Sounds like the same God in Isaiah, same God in the Psalms. Go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Acts chapter 10, a few pages over. To him, referring to him there is Jesus, give all the prophets witness. Oh, so we were talking about Jesus in the prophet Isaiah, right? I thought he wasn't in the Old Testament. Right. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever works. No, that's not what it says. It says, whosoever believe in his name shall receive remission of sins. I'm going to pause the sermon just for a second here. Because I think these are pretty good uh, questions, and I get angry because, you know, I know people, you know, like uh, Brother Jarrett was talking about this morning, you know, you know people and you have family that come against you for believing these things, and it's frustrating. It can get frustrating. And you say, why are you getting angry? Why are you harping on this? Well, because here's the, here's the bottom line. They're calling God a liar. We don't have the preserved word of God, then that means he lied. We have to work for our salvation, that means he lied. That's right. So they're calling God a liar. They're calling our Father in heaven a liar. We should get angry. That should anger us. It should anger you when the man who's uh, breaking his stones week in and week out to stand behind this, doing the study to preach before us, and somebody goes and tries to mock him or his family or tear him down. Oh, but Dave, they're a pastor. So what? They don't believe the Word of God. No. They're calling God a liar, and they're mocking Him. So it should anger us. If young men, if your dad is busting his hump to work to make sure that you're sitting in a comfortable seat in a church like this three times a week and taking uh, uh, all sorts of things, part of, and all sorts of things that the church does, and someone is mocking your dad, you ought to shut them up. Amen. You ought to tell them, you know what? I don't need to be around you. I don't, need, I don't need anything to do with you. Because you know what? People like that, they're friends with you. Oh, but I got them on Facebook. They're my friends. Nobody's going to like me now. They're going to unfriend me. What's more important? Guess what? If they're mocking the man of God that's standing up here, if they're mocking your dad, what do you think they're doing to you? Do you think that they're standing up for you? No. No, because they're going to somebody else talking about you. They're calling God a liar. And he just said, he has, I don't know if this thing is cracked, because he banged it so hard earlier today. But he believes this Bible. He believes this Bible. So if anyone is speaking about him, whether they're a pastor or some church down the street, and they're telling you, you ought to stand up for him and say, no. Because you know what? If we don't say anything, silence is what? Agreement. 
Young men, if they're, they're, they're downplaying your dad, your mom, for doing what they're doing, and you don't say anything, you're agreeing with them. Right. What did he say before? Brother Jared, before? Let them know exactly who you are right away. Yeah. Yo, dude, don't talk about my dad like that. Yo, dude, don't talk about my brother like that. You don't know. You, first of all, you don't even believe. We're not even in the same planet because you don't believe. Amen. Yeah. That's what we ought to say to them. Because it should anger us. It should anger us. Loyalty. Because guess what? If you're not loyal to the dad or to the man that's behind this pulpit, that you can see, how are you supposed to be loyal to the man you can't see? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Just like I said, it'll come out. What do you say now? I just look back. I just relax. I don't try to read people because they're going to tell me out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. Amen. So, um, Just on that thought, Romans 16, 17 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, to mark them which cause divisions. Because you know what? If they're talking against them, they're causing division. Mark them that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have heard, which you have learned, and avoid them. It says avoid them. It doesn't say, okay, I'm just not going to meet with you in church but I'll meet with you at Pete's Coffee on a Friday night. It doesn't say invite them over to your kid's birthday party because we're not in church. No, it says avoid them. Proverbs 6, 16 says this, these six things of the Lord hate, and Brother Jared talked about this a couple of weeks ago, a proud look, I'm sorry, these six things of the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and run into mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Amen. So if they're speaking against the man of God up here, if they're speaking against the man of God that's in your life, that's in your home, they're causing discord among you. Mm -hmm. Mark them and avoid them. Okay, I gotta press the, the pause button. Wait, is there a pause button anymore now? And I remember that. Remember, you can press pause now. I don't know if that's a, that's in stereos anymore. But back to the sermon, because it should anger us. It should anger us. Go to Romans four. I don't know if I told you to do, to go there. Where were we? In Acts. Yeah, go to uh, Romans. Romans chapter four. You all know these verses well. Let's look at them again. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but works a little? No, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans chapter 10, a few pages down. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart man works for himself. Is that what it says? No. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. By the way, this is not talking about confession of your sins. If you want to get that wrapped up, you don't confess your sins. There's confessing that Christ is your Lord and your Savior. Verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, but that's work, isn't it? I'm not even going to go there. I don't have time for that one. Turn to 1 Timothy. You got your finger in uh, 2 Timothy? If you go backwards to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, the living God, the same God that preserved His Word, the same God of the Old Testament, the same God that works for us, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that we believe. That believe. How do we make it right? We believe what the Bible says. Notice the theme here. We believe. We believe. We believe. Go back to Second uh, Timothy chapter three. We'll finish up here. Second Timothy chapter three. So those that say we do not have the preserved word of God, those that say we are done with all the Old Testament law, 
Those that say we have to work for us to be saved. They deny the power of God. What does Paul say in verse 5? Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. From such turn away. That could be hard. That could be hard. From such turn away, you say, Dave, yeah, but they're Christian. You say, yeah, Dave, I got them on Facebook, man. We've been friends for a long time. We've been homies from back in the day. Well, this is what Paul says they are. Verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because they don't believe in the first place. They don't believe that we have to preserve the Word of God. That's right. So right there, it's not even a, 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 an even playing field. We're not even on the same level. Okay, Dave, what's the point? What's the point of all this? Well, all that to say this. Do we believe the Word of God? Amen. I mean, some of us might be new to this and just kind of questioning and working and like, man, that brother Jared, Jared is always kicking and screaming and banging. I'm not so sure about this thing. You got to ask yourself, do you believe? Okay. Do we believe this first? There is a, uh, there's a scripture, uh, Isaiah 28. Keep your finger there in, in, in Timothy, but just go, to, go with me to Isaiah 28. I want, I want to show you something real quick. Isaiah 28. I just want to end with a couple of thoughts here. Isaiah 28, look at verse 13. But the word of the Lord was on to them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That's what we did tonight. We just took precept upon precept. We just took line upon line. We just took a little here from the Old Testament. And for those that question, because Jesus was never in the Old Testament, we took a little from the New Testament. Amen. Right? That's all we did. Why? Because this Bible will break you. God will break you. He's going to break you one way or another, whether you believe or whether you don't. You're going to be broke one way. Go back to 2 Timothy 3. And all we did was just look upon precept, upon precept. So how about when people come against us or against the man of God that labors week in and week out to teach you here? It's no coincidence that Paul says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. You know where that usually starts? <laughs> that usually starts in our families. Because once you take that stand, once you say, I believe, they're like, what? Whoa, whoa, hold up. Dude, I know you, Dave. I know your life. Yeah, you know what? God does too. And he forgot it. He doesn't remember it. When we take that leap, they're going to come against us. Usually, our family. Why? Why do they come against us? Because when we take a stance and believe that we have the preserved Word of God, many won't believe. When we apply the Old Testament teachings in our lives, many will come against us to try to tell us, hey, hey dude, keep up with the world. When we stand on faith and faith alone in Christ to save us, many will try to add works to that. And just for young parents, just be careful. Because you know that discord... They sow discord. You know, in our families, they get the pockets of the kids to the side by themselves, and they sow discord. That's right. While you're not looking. So just be mindful of that. It happens. It happens. So, verse 16. Do we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? We looked at the... The doctrine, we looked at the reproof. We looked at the correction. Notice in verse 17. Notice the reason. 
Let's look at it, verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. By the way, we're not talking about a perfect as a sinless man, for there is none righteous, no, not one. Amen. But perfect unto bearing fruit, good fruit unto God, fearing Him, following His commandments that He has not gotten rid of. Uh, works meet for the glory of Him in our lives. It's the Word of God, all Scripture, is for us to be reproved, is for us to be corrected, is for us to be instructed, but it's also for, so that we can answer those that come up with these false statements against us. So here's a question I have for you. Will we believe? Let's, have, let's have bow our heads in our word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for this night, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity and the honor to be up here to speak your word, Lord. I pray that, that we would glean from the scriptures, Lord. I pray for the Pazarnsky family, Lord, as they continue to lead this satellite, Lord, that you would give them strength and courage and boldness as you have already done, Lord. Just continue to keep them safe. I pray for all the families here, all the brothers and sisters, Lord, that you would give them grace and keep them safe. And I pray that we would believe. And I pray that we would stand and we would not be afraid, Lord, no matter what comes against us. But you, you have not left us alone, Lord. We have you. Thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you for the fellowship. I pray for the rest of uh, the evening. May it be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.